All right, we're going to get the show started. Dr. Michael Binder, thank you so much. You are a legend, legend of the nuclear industry here in Canada. And so it is my honor to have you on the show. My God, what an opening. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, so here, I'll tell you really why I'm so excited. So, so you used to run this place, right? Uh, we're here at the, for, for anyone who hasn't listened to the first three episodes, we're here at the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Uh, one of the reasons I'm excited to get you on the show is I'm hoping now that you're retired, you're free to say whatever you want. No holds barred. Let's get into it. Never stopped me before. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, you have a kind of an unusual path to the nuclear industry. I remember when we spoke on the phone, boy, this must have been like a year ago at this point. You told me that you got into government on the telecom side initially. Right. In fact, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm a, I, I, I got a PhD in physics, theoretical physics from the University of Alberta. Mm. And I was on academic kind of a trend. And then I got talked into, you know, to come here to Ottawa to try something was really off the wall. It was Defense Research Board. Mm. This is 1971, you know, they were burning flags, etc. <laughs> Military wasn't kind of an attractive uh, career. Yeah, especially for a hippy-dippy uh, physicist. Uh, uh, exactly. <laughs> but it was so unusual what they offered me. Yeah. Uh, so I said, oh, well, why not? I'll go and try it for a couple of years. And what was, what was it that was so interesting? It was war know? games at the time. Uh, the military was, you know, in Vietnam. And there was the Warsaw Pact against yeah. the NATO Pact. Europe yeah. uh, was um, totally armed and ready for confrontation. And um, my job, I was in air defense. My job was how many planes do we need in Europe to make sure we can stop um, warship attack. Whoa. So it's a simulation, it's mathematical, it's all that stuff. And uh, they recruited me because I did some uh, mathematical modeling in the university and um, they liked some of the methodology I used. And they always, it's so funny, the, uh, like the true geniuses are always the people who know a lot of math and always end up getting plucked for these like uh, extremely important missions. I mean, not even just extremely important missions, but also in the like the financial sector, they're pulling out mathematicians now and everything. It's like yeah. the mathematicians are, uh, are recognized as a, uh, a special people. Well, it's uh, the logic of um, analysis, yes. uh, which always, you know, that's what ended up being. I, for, for two years, turned into 47 years <laughs> in government. <laughs> but the government, governments are so big yeah. that you are in so many different areas. So from defense research, then they recruited me for a brand new department called Urban Affairs, mm. where they were trying to simulate the urbanization process in Canada mm. and the mobility of jobs and workers. And, um, and after that, I uh, went to development, the Canada Mortgage and Housing, which is, again, um, affordability and development, you know, development. We, we were involved in developing uh, waterfront properties that were government-owned, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. What like, was your role there when you switched? So at first you were just the like the brilliant kid mathematician playing war games, but then and then eventually you became you were running the show for the various departments. No, so it's again incremental. Yeah. So it's all R and D. So you're managing um, research, um, development, uh, prototyping, thing of that nature, and then um, but but it's it's getting into government. So. If I had to characterize what I am is I always was in the science and innovation business. Mm. Uh, I'm not a nuclear specialist, so, but I spend a lot of time trying to understand policy and regulation in government. Mm. Um, and uh, so I was in central agency, treasury board, which is uh, in the US lingo is like, they're almost close to the White House and all that <laughs> stuff. Um, and uh, learn how the government functioned, basically. Mm. But um, then I spent 20 years in something called the uh, Department of Communication and then became Industry Canada, where I was Mr. Telecom, really. And this is when the telecom industry was going through a huge transformation. So, so, so you talked about um, 
you know, the, the step function innovation. Yeah. But I go, it looks like a step function, but it's really incremental. Okay, tell me. So in 85, I'm in telecom. What's a big event in telecom in 85 in Canada? It happened in 84 in the U.S. I was born in 86, so give me some, <laughs> give me some slack here. I don't know. What was it? Cell phone. Yeah. There okay, no, that's when it first came out. First, no cell phone. I thought phone. it came out in high school when I was 16. And, uh, and I, yeah. <laughs> listen, when I talk to some of the kids who come to, you know, to, yeah. you know, uh, to government and, and they ask me, what do you mean? There were no cell phones before in 84 and 86. What did you do? <laughs> How did you communicate? You know, they, nobody thinks about this nowadays. Yeah. But it's only, so if you look at it now, it's, it was a huge change, but it's not that long ago. Mm. So it feels like a huge change because, so fast forward to 89 mm -hmm. in this town. What do you think in 89 was? So 85 is cell phone, 89, this town, email. Ah, and it wasn't the, it wasn't the Microsoft. It wasn't the internet. It was some. Um, you guys remember? Uh, we used to call them. Uh, 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 I can't remember. They were private, um, like Freenet. Oh yeah, I don't uh, know. You know the bulletin boards. Oh okay, message boards. Yeah, message they called them board. message boards. Maybe yeah. Before, before. So then, so this is eighty nine. Then you gotta go to '95, when the WWW came aboard, where the internet became a reality. Yeah. So between '85 and '95, uh, it's not a long time. Yeah. For major change, and I remember, we um, we were lucky at the time because we anticipated some of the revolution because I was in the Department of Communication. Um, my my uh, my gang at the research laboratory. We were playing with wireless. We were playing with uh, broadband, etc. So we knew we knew because the cable guys were fighting with the telecom guys, mm. and the wireless people um, were coming on the other side. So we had an advisory committee of the whole industry that we've created. And uh, we talked about all those issues and how to get some consensus about all of this. So even then, we all knew something is happening, but we couldn't imagine an Amazon. Yeah. We couldn't imagine a Facebook. Yeah. Okay. We, but we did talk about government online. <laughs> Early days. Is the government online yet? In fact, funny story about <laughs> this. Uh, we got a call from the White House. Ah at the time and because we had uh, we had a bulletin board for the government and uh, the minister our minister at the time was uh, decided he's going to be a champion of technology on this so he said anybody can send me an email and it became known and he would take a, uh, it was a whole story we can get into that because some of the long hair hippies would send a note to the minister <laughs> and wanted an instantaneous reply <laughs> <laughs> whereas bureaucrats don't work that way. They take <laughs> the email, consult, write a note, advise the minister what to say. Uh, so there was again a shift in speed of reaction. Yeah. The White House phoned us and said, "Well, how did you guys do that?" You know, um, and they set up a kind of um, a, a web. No, no, it wasn't a website, but a bulletin board that people can send an email. And uh, they got flooded, and they <laughs> they had an automatic reply. You say thank you for you, you know, etc. They didn't. It was it didn't go over very well because <laughs> the whole idea is you gotta have some live person on the other side, right? Yeah, leave it to uh, leave it to Americans to take it to the next level, and then get angry if they don't get a response uh, in two minutes. I, well, the same here. It's the same thing. Uh, and but you gotta, I gotta tell you, in terms of policy and regulation, the government of Canada at the time. Um, Maybe it's a lack of the draw. Maybe we were at the right time, but uh, we got real a lot of buy-in. And um, uh, as a result of this advisory committee, which was all the CEOs, mm. the cable companies and the telecom companies were in their room with the labor, etc. And we decided on a game plan to roll out um, 
the, the technology, uh, for example, we, the first country, people don't know this, the first country to connect all the library and all the schools to the internet wow. in the world. And what was the strategy there? Because I, w- I want to understand, because um, I'm, I'm sensing that's strategic to have done that, not just, uh, oh, this is a fun thing we can do for our schools. Because if you believed, and that's what the advisory committee believed, that in the future, you, you, you had to be um, literate in computing mm. and in math. You have to understand because that's coming big time. So how do you reach out to the kids? By the way, principals and teachers were not fans. When we approached schools and said, look, we want to give you a computer, they'd say, don't waste your time on computers, hire more teachers. Mm. And the way we snuck in, incrementally, by the way, we started with 300 schools, uh, we went through the librarians. Because ah, the library they like access to information. Absolutely. And yeah. they had more technical savvy. Yes. And we did computer for school. We put a, a computer for school uh, where all the surplus computers for bureaucrats got refurbished and sent to school. Because, you know, there's a, there was a cycle every three years would you would get a new computer yeah. or every four years. But the computer was perfectly fine. Yeah, yeah. So we put in school some, instead of car yeah. shop, yeah. put a computer shop. That's and so funny. they refurbished. So, and the volunteers were the telecom uh, retirees. They taught them how to do all of this. It was like a production. Some of it still exists uh, across the river here. There's a whole huge warehouse where they refurbish oh, refurbished uh, computers, computers and give them to people who can afford it. <laughs> Okay, so this is a way that you you kind of saw uh, saw how technology was changing within your space. You met with the leadership of industry, understood the issues, tried to predict the future. You can never predict the future, but you try, and then try to get one step ahead of it by taking proactive action to understand the issue and to uh, implement the best sides of the technology uh, in a way that would further advance the interests of your country. And it continues because... <clears throat> If you think about once it became known that kids take to computers yeah. and the emails and all the things that went with it, and the small companies like Amazon started to become a reality. So the next thing is, is speed mm. and accessibility to all. Mm. Uh, because kids would do their homework now on computers. So what do you do? I see. So step one, the... step one was get the computer there. Step two is lay the uh, the wired infrastructure, the telecom infrastructure through the grounds, the cables, the fiber optics, so on and so forth. And broadband. Yeah. Satellite. This is Canada. Yeah. So. Yeah. How uh, do you get? To, how do you get uh, internet? I'll, I'll, I'll the digress on nowhere. that one. So we. Uh, or Edmonton. <laughs> so we uh, decided that uh, in the north we got a we got a, a, a territory called Nunavut. Nunavut, I've never even heard of it. So Nunavut is a little piece of land, something like, I think about four or five times the size of Texas, Mm. (laughs) with an enormous population of, there's 23 communities, (laughs) with total total population 10 years ago was about 30,000. Oh my God, twice the size of Texas. (laughs) In, in, In area, in area, it's huge. So how do you get to them? Yeah. So the only way to get to them is satellites. Ah, so you guys invest in satellite infrastructure so as well? So we put in a satellite, uh, we put in uh, a free transponder, wow. they reach out to them, and we put, uh, there was one os- only one hospital to those remote communities. So when uh, you say who, we, who is we, right? So you were part of the, uh, the telecom government, you were part yeah. of the government telecom, but is, is it a regulator of telecom? Is it a, uh, so what all, is it? So, so, you know, all those technology are running on spectrum. Yeah. Right. By the way, that's another radiation we can talk about. The non-ionizing <laughs> radiation, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which has a lot of the features of people don't understand. They want the cell phone, but the show is they don't want the the broadcasting, uh, if you like, dish right yeah. in their house. So we had a lot of issues with that. 
Um, but what we've done is, so Telesat, which is our satellite uh, company, um, oh, you want an approval for a slot, which is, by the way, regulated internationally. All the telecommunication slots for broadcasting and telecommunication in the satellite, mm. people think, why regulate it? It's out there in space. But believe it or not, they're very crowded. Yeah. They are, because every nation wants a, an ability to use a particular spectrum, yes. and they interfere with each other. So yes. you got allocated, and the ITU in Geneva um, allocate this. So we used to t tell us that, oh, you want a piece of the spectrum, we're going to go and pitch for you to get that. But in return, <laughs> you're going to do some public access. Smart. So one, of, one or two transponders were dedicated for that. Sounds like you had good control over the industry. You knew just what buttons to push. And... Well, it's not control. I'm a free marketeer. Yeah, i got to yeah. tell you, yeah, I yeah, am yeah. all for free market. Yeah. They came to me many times trying to set up standards. Yeah. But I, early in my life, I remember their big fight about uh, beta and VHS. I don't <laughs> yeah, know if you're, yeah, yeah. You're too young. Well, to I, I know that. the stories, though. Yeah. <laughs> hey, beta, I'm a tech nerd. I know the good tech story. Beta was by far better technology. <laughs> VHS won because they went to market first. We had um, Blu-ray and uh, HDVD in my day. That was our big controversy. And you know, whoever goes to market first kind of uh, have a, a big advantage. Oh, yeah. So we, um, we, we always make sure that uh, with, in return for allocation of spectrum, etc., we always look for what is the public um, best policy. Yes. So I always ask for, in return, for instead of license fees, we used to have license fees, uh, we will have you invest in R&D. Mm. Like a percentage of revenue goes into R&D. We always insisted it's part of the policy and regulatory thing. Wow. And, and, uh, and in fact, at the end, what I didn't like is when there was a lot of competitors trying to provide wireless services, uh, there were a bunch of bureaucrats sitting in a room like this and trying to select a winner. And I, that's why I set up auctions. We Tell me about up, these auctions. Those are spectrum allocation auctions. Yes. In fact, we're going to have a big and one. Let the, and let the free market decide. Absolutely. God, you know, it's so funny. I'm so glad to hear you say this because one of the big issues that I have with the nuclear community is this whole, oh, someone should just pick a winner. The government should just pick a winner. I'm like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Come some free market <laughs> way. Like, just don't have the government pick a winner. Like, let private capital come in, let them duke it out, let them compete for who's the best, and then we're all going to win. I'm leaving it now. We have 11, 11 uh, vendor design review Good. ongoing. Good. <laughs> and wh why I'm excited about that, Yeah. it's none of them have government money or, they, or yeah. didn't come to us with government money, even yeah. though since then they got some. It's all venture capital. I love it. I love it. But before we fast forward too much, I'm going to make you talk about that. Uh, it must have been a big culture shock for you coming from this uh, free market, let the, let the industry figure it out type stuff. I'll just kind of nudge here and there where I can to the nuclear industry. You come into the nuclear industry, it's got to be a, different, a whole different ballgame. So, so I, got, I told you uh, I used to get into trouble by saying things in, in public. So I remember one of the saying that really got attention was I was in um, in a huge conference dealing with um, regulators role um, in making a decision mm. about it was telecommunication at the time and uh, I remember when it and there was a Chinese in there and there were you know the, the German and the, everybody um, uh, in in this panel with me and I, um, and I said, we got into a heated, heated debate about the role, what the government should do, the government should pick a winner. And I said, you know what? My experience has been the government is really, really terrible at picking winners. And I should have stopped there. But I said, but losers are very good at picking government. <laughs> <laughs> 
So they got a big quote. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Came back here to Ottawa and I got a little bit of uh, scolding. Uh, scolding and discussion. <laughs> I said, but it's true. Yeah. Because those who come to government and complain and yell and want support normally get support. Yeah. So we now have 11 um, applicants, if you like, for our regulator design review. And we can get into what does that mean? And they want me to pick one up. I'm not. I and I told CNL, I told uh, Mark Lezinski, don't pick one for God's sake. Yeah. You got enough room to yeah. let all yes. of them to come. Yes. But that's not the way the industry works. The what do you industry, mean it's not the way the industry works? Well, the industry uh, and some of the bureaucrats here uh, who have a little bit of money to dish out for support. Um, Say, well, why don't you pick one and go behind that? Well, the problem is you'll never know which one to pick. Right. And uh, we shouldn't pick. We should let them. I don't mind if you and, give and, facilities, uh, if you give them a laboratory facilities. I don't mind if you give them even some play money. Yeah. But don't ever think, I mean, so the American is putting into new scale uh, a lot of money and they're putting in there and they're going to build maybe the first uh, model. So they are picking a winner. Uh, yeah. in there. Um, maybe in the nuclear, that's the only way you can do it because of the amount of money, but uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. No, I actually think there's far more money in private markets than there is in government. The nuclear right. people don't think that way because most of the nuclear entrepreneurs, they come up through the lab system. They come up through academia. Their entire their entire worldview of how to get money is to uh, apply for grants. <laughs> That is not the way that the rest of the economy works. You go out, you find investors, you convince people to believe in you, you find high-risk investors for when you're earlier stage, you prove <laughs> some things out, you find medium risk investors for growth, you get to become a developed industry, you find even more investors at that point. There's far more money in private markets than there is in government. I'm with you with a but. Okay, I want to hear the but, yes, teach me. The bad is that the vendors and the venture capitalists are not the utilities. At the end of the day, the consumer yes. will get the, the result of the consumable yes. through another entity. Yes. So the venture capitalists, uh, the Bill Gates of this world, will have to get a utility to come and say, you know what? Uh, okay, we'll use your stuff because... Yes. To, to it's give called also. sales. That's it's a function of a company. Yeah, but you know, but then uh, many many of the uh, many of the utilities are monopolies, local monopolies. Yeah. So they and they have a board of directors. I know. And um, the board of directors are very conservative people, and they would say, you know, what, what would I go with you guys? Show me. Yeah. First, show me, which leads us back into where is the prototype? Where is the first one to go? Yeah. And that's, that's why it's different than the, the Apple of this world, where the Apple are the end vendors directly to the consumers. Yes. So it's slightly different. I haven't it's more complicated. Worked out, it's harder. Very complicated. Yeah. So I haven't worked up my, uh, in my mind how it's going to shape out. But I'm with you. Uh, wherever you can play... So some, some government, like uh, New Brunswick here, uh, decided to pick up two, and they gave, uh, I don't know, five million bucks uh, to play with them in return for establishing head office over there mm. and, uh, and being over there. And the reason it may work is because it's an existing facility, a nuclear facility that has a, a license site, mm. a lot easier to go in there, even though they still have to go through the regulatory thing. But we have, but those are American and, and, uh, and UK companies. But we've got a Canadian terrestrial. Yeah. We've got a lot of uh, ink, good company, yeah. nice, innovative, kind of a multi uh, kind of a thing. I'm a fan of this. Now I can, I can itch my wagon to. Yeah, uh, okay. Can. I want to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they now also, uh, one of the two that were, um, Pass our vendor design, and they are also in CNL. Yeah, they went through the phase phase, um, and they they decide on a you know on on a size of two hundred uh, megawatt electric, and they think they have a real uh, good, well articulated plan. Yeah, the question is, which utility will pick it up? 
And uh, the, the thing is, you know, in Canada, it's very simple. It's not yeah. as complicated in the state. We got Bruce. Yeah. We got Darlington. We got NB Power. And we got CNL. Yeah. Those are the only four sites that right now have a nuclear site. I see, yes. So it's a lot easier to do this. If you want to go into how much, a how virgin... How easier? Yeah, let's say you go into a new, a new market, new territory. What would it be to get the environmental site portion done? 20 million, 30 million, what does it cost? Okay, so now you're coming into a whole new world because the government, this government just came up with a new bill. Okay. It's called C69. Okay. And they rewrote all the environmental assessment uh, requirement have not been done before. Okay. Hugely controversial. Is it going to be easier or harder? Where are we going with this? Well, <laughs> oh, no. uh, if you talk to some people, uh, uh, particularly on pipeline, yeah. it's going to be very difficult. Okay. Uh, but I think that there is um, a cutoff. At about, I think it's about 200 uh, megawatt where you don't have to go through that process. You, you got to go to the CNSC. So, but a lot of it is um, remains to be played out because yes. it's involved in a lot more analysis, socioeconomic, gender, um, indigenous community. So things that we have not really been done in depth before. So it remains to be seen, but I am optimistic. I don't think that's gonna be a showstopper. The showstopper what might be is find a community is not afraid of nuclear yeah. and burning. Canada should be the poster child for this technology. Yeah. You know, because of the remote communities, we're burning diesel 24-7. Yeah. It's expensive. It's polluting. It sometimes has to be brought in by air. Uh, but will you get the community to agree? But what about the communities seen. that already have nuclear? Uh, anyone, I mean, literally, it's like every community that has nuclear loves nuclear. No problem there. Right. So why not start off with just tacking on an additional small unit next to a big unit and just get, you know, to get the economics going, to get, you know, to demonstrate. So, uh, perfect. Yeah. So Darlington. Right. So why would Terrestrial or any, any of these companies, not just to pick on them, but why wouldn't any of them just go straight to the existing nuclear regulator. Hey, we've got you guys are already producing two gigawatts or something. Here's an extra 200 megawatts boost for you. We we saw you. We we took the overhead satellite. We saw you get some forest there. We're gonna put it right there. We can already show you where it's gonna go. Connect to your switchyard. Simple as that. Right. The community loves it. They already love your big one. No problems. What's right. the problem? So the so from a regulator perspective, my line to them was, where's your application? Yeah, where is the application? Send me an application. Okay, so why, why, well, yeah, so, so you mentioned design review. I assume design review comes before application? Yeah, design review is the vendor talking to our staff yeah. about, is there any showstopper in a design? And how come any none of these 11 companies have gotten through the vendor design review? If it, all it is is asking about showstoppers. No, but some of them are quite advanced. Uh, but have any even gotten to application? Have any filed an application, any of the new ones? So, so the design review application is a separate from okay. a license application. I see, I see. Okay, okay. License application. In fact, our lawyers make sure that uh, the two are not connected because normally the license application will come from the utility. Uh, does it have to be that way? No. Okay. If you want to be boo, build, own, and operate. Yes, yes. If Terrestrial wants to tell Darlington, you know, or, or a mining company in the north, yes, you know what? Just buy power from uh, us. We'll buy power. We'll yeah, yeah. put it in, take it out. Yeah. Uh, the, the mining company said, where do I sign? Just yeah. show, me, show me the bloody thing. Yeah. So I don't think that um, the vendors as yet are comfortable that the license application will get through easily. Why? What, what do they think is going to be the, the stopper? What do they think? Where do they think it's going to get held up that they don't engage in this? In the I license think most of them believe we're talking about significant amount of money. So what they know, what they want to do is they want to have a utility behind them that will do the application. And where is where? Why is it so expensive uh, to get through the process? If you're if you're able to very, you already had your engineers 
design it to be safe, right? They, they designed the system, they considered factors of safety, they did material calculations, they did stress. In order to get your engineering design done, you had to consider safety throughout the entire process. Absolutely. Why not just document that as you go through the, the process they and do. then hand it over to the regulator and say, read this. We made very clear assumptions on material strength, very clear assumptions on uh, what would happen in this scenario, that scenario. Why is it, uh, why is it a, a many year process as opposed it's to... It's not many, it's as fast as they can deliver the documentation to our staff because yes. they can look at it. We, you know, so what are they afraid of? Why are they afraid that's going to be so expensive? If it's it's not that expensive okay. because uh, we charge for the vendor design um, I should stop saying we. I'm not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, CNSC charges yes. for staff time. Yes. Okay. One other thing I can tell you when I came in, you asked me, I came to this place and I couldn't believe the conservatism and the lack of uh, lack of uh, sharing of information. Were you able to change that during your time here? Well, I can I, I can tell you that uh, I some of the talk with my colleagues in INRA and in other places, trying to, to remind them that physics in China is the same as physics in Canada, <laughs> and therefore let's not reinvent the wheel. Yeah. So we kind of deal with the US, yeah. we kind of deal with the UK and the NEA on SMRs, yeah. that uh, if we have advanced knowledge on uh, terrestrial, you have advanced knowledge on new scale. Share it. Share it. Yeah, physics and is the same everywhere. Absolutely, and we're doing it, and. And by the way, this sovereignty, this uh, regulatory sovereignty, you're going to hear a lot of that. I've heard a lot of it. I don't like the sound Government of Government love that. And it's not only now it's drugs. If the U.S. FDA approve a drug, yeah. you think that you figure that human being in the state yeah, yeah. Are, the, exactly. yeah. are the same as here. So why not automatically take it? Uh -uh. So why is this? It. Why yeah? What is this sovereignty stuff, and why does it persist? It's a government sovereignty. But it seems like it drives up cost and Absolute. reduces innovation. Right. So it's not <laughs> only it's not only it's not only in in Canada. And it's not only in nuclear. Yeah. yeah. You, but you know, it's funny because in the telecommunication business, that's the the reason. Think about where the telecom came from. Mm. So think about the telex. You know, the telex was, no. ITU is the oldest uh, UN uh, international body. The oldest, it was uh, 100 years before um, Canada was, I, I don't know the date, uh, 80, we were put in 1867, I think they were before us. They had to develop a protocol, so when you press the button in Japan, it clicks here. Oh, we're going way back. <laughs> so, same thing with phones. Yeah. The reason your cell phone works internationally, yes. it's not by accident. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> agreed to standards. Yes. Okay? You think there would be an agreed to standard in nuclear? Yeah. No, not yet. If SMR are going to succeed, yes. their standard got to be internationally accepted. So. Terrestrial, accepting in Canada, let's say, on their standard, we got to overcome the prescriptive notion that the U.S. Yes. that does that and you cannot deviate and we deviate, etc. We believe in, a, in it's, a, it's a risk in form, it's an it's a out, out, outcome uh, managed. So, so what, what so, would happen when you had a conversation with the NRC about this? Because they'll, they'll respect you, but if industry goes to them and say, hey, we want more risk-informed instead of prescriptive, they could be like, well, you're industry and we're government and our job is to push back. No, but, I think no, I think they've bought into this. In fact, Congress was so upset, they, some of them said, why Canada can do it? Why can't you? Well, that, so that's, I mean, that's how you get change to happen is when another country but does Sivinsky, something But Savinsky is, uh, is on, on board. Yes. Uh, and so, so what is it going to take for her to... Uh, to listen. So they're fast-tracking new scale. They're fast-tracking some... Uh, Four I years fast-track. I don't know if... Well, that's the first one because, remember, they, they yeah. had to uh, adjust their legislation and uh, it's not easy to change m momentum on I, status quo. But I still don't understand how it costs $500 million to a billion dollars 
to approve something that works on design principles that we have experience with and we've practiced with for many years. And uh, forget even the new stuff with the molten salts and the new stuff, but like the new scale thing. It's still a PWR. It's right. still got water. It's got metal. Why would it ever take $500 million of questions and answers over the course of four years to have engineers on both sides, the regulator side and the designer side, to agree that something is safe? Uh, it shouldn't. In my view, if we're talking about, you know, unit underneath the, the build and operate, yeah. uh, and, you know, 500 million to a billion max, if it's going to go beyond that, it's not going to happen. Because if it's going to be a lot more than that, they all want to get the bigger machines. Um, yeah. If yeah. SMR... It kills the whole principle of SMR. If you got it, if it takes, if it costs so much just to get it the regulation, that then you have to build it bigger just to pay off your licensing right. fees, then it's no longer an SMR, and you have kind of lost the whole purpose. Or else they believe it's upfront cost, and then the rest of production you can manufacture them, uh, and uh, you know, and do literally dozens of them, so you recover the cost that way. I, I, I don't know the economics. We don't know the economics, but we all know that if it's not going to be cheaper and faster, and many of them, it's not going to work. Okay, so what did you see here that you would, um, that you think even maybe the vendors here were being too conservative on, that you think they should have done to make things go through faster? So I don't easier? think it's the vendors. I think it's the utilities. Utilities. Absolutely. There's only... Okay, so uh, explain to me then how the utilities play a role here. So the, the vendors want the utilities as money. They got the money. Right. So they go to the utilities and say, hey, will you file this application for us? Is that what happens? Normally, they, normally if a utility selected a vendor, they would come to the regulator together. They would, uh, okay. Because they have to learn how to operate it. It's not yes. only the safety, the regulator will determine whether it's safe enough. But they have to be very comfortable. They know how to operate it safely. Yes. Which means that, you know, all the skills of uh, required from security to safety to emergency management and all that stuff. The problem with uh, the Canadian kind of thing, Darlington and Bruce are now in the biggest refurbishment project, mm. right? So they're good for many, many like years. They don't need the power. So again, I am i don't know for a fact, but I'm guessing they're not in a rush. Right. New Brunswick, again, have a re relatively new refurbished um, uh, uh, NPP, so they're not in a rush. What they're missing here is first to market. And then to be first to market, you have to have an international ambition. Yes. Because if you're not first to market, if you don't care about the international to market, you can do what everybody said, oh, I'll wait until the Americans do this. Do utilities in Canada invest in infrastructure projects outside of Canada? In the U.S., we used to, and then when the Enron scandal happened, uh, they, the, all the utilities just pulled out of their foreign infrastructure and uh, asset investments. What right. happened? The can, does Canada follow no. SNC-Lavalin is the one that takes the can-do technology. And sells it around and, the world. And sells it around the world. But they're not they a utility. They're no. a constructor. Well, are there any utilities here that sell no. assets across the world? No, they try to. But you know what? That's the issue. But we know who does that. China, Russia, <laughs> yeah, Korea. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and again, relying on my telecom business. Mm -hmm. You truly, so again, I'm dating myself. I think it was 80, where was Tiananmen Square? About two years yeah. after Tiananmen Square, yeah. the world decided that maybe it's time to sort of start talking to the Chinese again. And we were the first international formally recognized delegation mm. to China for a visit on telecom. Yes. And it was our, the minister was paying bidding, in fact. And at those days, China penetration of telecommunication was five, ten percent. Mm. Beijing had telecom, but all the outside, it's a big country, yeah, yeah. a very big country geographically. There was no telecommunication anywhere. And the minister said to me, you know what? We have a five-year plan. And they actually started to do this. Yeah. And every year, they roll out enough infrastructure the size of Canada. 
they are now the biggest wireless uh, market in the world. So when Apple yeah, yeah, yeah. selling there, if China, you know, China and the US still fighting there with yeah, China yeah, yeah. Uh, causing trouble to Apple, right away Apple, uh, you, you look at the stock market, it goes yeah. down. The problem here is that with, in return for building this infrastructure, the Chinese said to all the telecom guys, come on right in, come on right in. So I remember Nortel, Nortel at yeah, the Nortel, time was yeah. one of the biggest uh, telecom. And I remember we were pitching really hard for to get into China. And they, they, we got into a, a good time, we got a good window and the Chinese said, by all means, you can come in. What we want you to do for us is you're gonna set up a university and teach us how to, um, you know, to build and service those uh, servers of telecommunication. So if you look at what happened, right? After they had the uh, at and in there, they had uh, Alcatel in there, they had Nortel in there, they had all of them, G, Atachi, all of them were there. They cherry picked the best technologies. Yeah. They invested in all of this. Yeah. And created Huawei. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the Huawei. Oh, the, the, this is the classic China playbook. Absolutely. Invite is, them in. That, say, hey, we've got some money. We'll be your first customer. Teach us how to build this. Teach right. us more. Oh, we get to see all your designs. Oh, we're going to pick the best. And then we'll develop our own industry and export it around the world. So switch now to nuclear. Yeah. So what's well, happening in China? Yeah. Western guys in China. Well, how did they, how did they fall for it is the question, because now China's going to export nuclear around the whole world. They do. Yeah. They already do. Yeah. You know, even... Uh, Listen, not that, not that I mind. I would rather uh, China take over the, the energy industry and the world be saved from climate change. Uh, but on the other hand, we could do that too. In the US or in Canada could be the ones exporting nuclear technology around the world. But... Okay, so I'm with you. Um, but the point is here that the Chinese has ambition to become international. Wait, so we're not ambitious right. in the we're, Western world? We're not. Why? Why? We, Why we not? Look, the U.S. and Canada were the place where innovation occurs yes. in telecommunication. Yes. You know, cell phone and all this came from the U.S., yeah. okay, from the AT&T labs. Yes. Uh, Nortel here was also one of the uh, kind of uh, pioneers in all of this. Um, so, it, good jobs, good R&D, good all this. If you want to do that, you've got to foster innovation and competition internationally. Yes. Otherwise, you are a consumer of uh, somebody else's technology. Right. Nothing wrong with this, but, but to give up the whole field of innovation. Crazy. Uh, yeah. So, we got to become more ambitious. Absolutely. So, it means, yeah. but where do yeah. you see the utilities doing that? Um, no, utilities are the only thing Westing as conservative house, as nuclear are the utilities. Well, you see, Westinghouse used to be a big ticket item in there. Uh, GE, all yeah. those, look what happened to, uh, to them. Yeah. So coming back to, so what happening in Canada now is, what I'm afraid of is that um, we would lose whatever advantage we had by having those vendors come to us first. Yes. And we look at the technology and taking advantage of this and building first to market with all the risk, but all the benefit. Uh, if we don't do that, then we will wait for somebody else to do this. Okay, so what do you what do you want action items moving forward to not let to not let that happen and to instead be able to take advantage of the brilliance, the innovation, the technology, the hard work, the laying the foundation? Uh, how what do we need to do to make sure that we can take advantage of that? So, um, in all the um, the free market, the government is a big role. I mean, I mean, even the state, internet happened with ARPA. You know yeah, all right, about yeah, ARPA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and still, they, uh, they, uh, everybody think about the, um, you know, the Silicon Valley is uh, something that was created over the blue moon. Most of the contract, the first contract, were defense contract yeah, yeah, and yeah. government. Yeah. So government is a big role to play, particularly in nuclear, which is so highly regulated. Utilities, the utilities, the government owned by yeah. and large. So you got to allow for the venture capital to flourish, but the venture capital wants to see some sim symbol of interest and support.
to get politician to say something nice about nuclear. Why is that, though? Uh, you can get them to say nice things about coal, about oil, about gas, about toxic solar panels. You, know, you get them to say nice things about everything. Why can't we get them to say nice things about They're afraid nuclear? of nuclear. Why? Uh, well, you know, uh, it's the same. It's, it's built in from radiation, war, mushrooms, uh, you know, the, this uh, bomb mushroom. But the, other, the, other industries, which also have these built-in... Uh, you know, negative qualities about them or built-in negative perceptions about them, somehow still manage to do it. They hire the best lobbyists. They hire the best marketing people. They say what needs to be said. They, the textile industry, the chemical industry, they do it. Like People don't like chemicals, but somehow they're able to hire the right people and just get it done. It doesn't have the same, um, you know, it doesn't have the China syndrome. It doesn't have the armor. I mean... They, they call me in some of the public hearing, uh, Mr. Omer. Uh, and if you look at what we can you know anything about nuclear, it's from something like that. I have people come in front of me all the time that says one becquerel can kill you. One becquerel can mute my, uh, mutate my, my cell and I get cancer and it'll kill me. But so, so there is a built-in fear from there and you cannot, for whatever, the political calculation is that there is no payoff for them to be supportive of nuclear. Even though Ontario is my real, uh, I'm really annoyed with Ontario. If there was one jurisdiction that should brag, yeah. beside France, by yeah. the way, France is also about 75% yeah. nuclear, this province got rid of coal yeah. because of nuclear. It's a shining star. Nuclear now is 60%, 60% of electricity, yeah. more than 60% is nuclear. Yeah. Together with hydro. Yeah, uh, yeah you're 100% clean. Uh, 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 we are, I think, about the, the 80, uh, maybe 70. Okay, so... So why we, uh, isn't the, even the premier, the yeah. previous premier, yeah. They went to Kyoto, didn't say boo about nuclear. Yes, but um, mm. it, it, it's, still on, it's still our fault because it, it, we have to convince them to do that. Like we, so we have to find the right guy who knows the right guy to pull him aside and say, listen, this is a huge opportunity. It's an opportunity for you to show world leadership in the environment. It's an opportunity for us to create a market for products that we can sell around the world. Someone has to like, get through to the premier. Right. And that's our fault. We need to do that. We need to hire his cousin or something who can get us in the room with him. You know? so, so it's funny, you know, that um, we, the, um, the last prime minister in Canada that did this was Jean Chrétien. Uh, we went to China and sold him two can-dos. Um, in fact, he, he, one of his political jokes is against Harper. Yeah. He said, uh, when I went to China, I got them to buy two can-dos. This prime minister goes to China and he comes back with two they call them. Uh, I'm having a, a senior moment here. The bear, the be little bear. Uh, bear. The Chinese panda bear. Panda bear. Panda bear. <laughs> we'll, okay, we'll, panda. Edit the we'll edit the joke together <laughs> so it comes right. up. <laughs> when this prime minister goes to China, he comes back with two pandas. Yeah. yeah so yeah. can do versus pandas. Yeah. So yeah. it was kind of a cute little thing. But yeah. you know, the, the, um, our pair was actually um, in supportive of nuclear yeah. because we cut a deal with India on selling uh, uranium and having a nuclear bilateral arrangement with India yeah. after many, many years. But politically, uh, for whatever reason, on both sides, I was disappointed with you know, Obama. I was very disappointed I was very with disappointed. Obama. I, and you know who he had? He had Ernie Moniz as his, um, another physicist, new, right. head of a nuclear department at MIT, as his like chief energy advisor, essentially. And I'm, a, I'm more disappointed with Moniz, that Moniz couldn't get Obama to go more nuclear. So, so we are very good at speaking to ourselves. Yeah. You go to many conference and we hold hands and we all agree, yeah. et cetera. We are not very good in getting into, for example, we're going to have an election now. Yeah. You're going to have a big election. I've never heard anybody ask a question of all this democratic uh, candidate. Yeah. What's your policy on nuclear? Yeah. Crazy. Well, why don't you ask him to ask some of those? I other? am. So I got one. I got one on my show. So we wrote to all of them. 
one came on our show and I got him to say he liked nuclear. Well, that's so is he living near a nuclear facility? Uh, where is he? Well, I guess he's based out of. Well, you know what? This is what's crazy. This guy's from Massachusetts, and Massachusetts doesn't even like nuclear. <laughs> so, so, that's, yeah. so that's so yeah, that we can do. We can get them one by one. That's the problem. But yeah. you gotta do it on national TV to argue. You're not gonna get the one and a half degree without nuclear. I know. You're not gonna get into two degrees without nuclear. I know. So you gotta do something with well, nuclear. I'm starting to. Uh, I want to create this debate. So you. Um, you mentioned one of the videos that you saw of me doing lectures. So I start, uh, you know, I start off with this podcast. Now I'm doing uh, lectures at, you know, in, in front of nuclear classrooms. Now, and then I'm transitioning that into lectures in front of environmental audiences. And I'm going to come out as ho- more hard than even the nuclear uh, community will feel comfortable with me saying about all the, all the pros about nuclear until I force it down their throats, until I force it down the world's throat to come out and you have to talk about this issue. Yeah. Well, there are some people who are doing it. Uh, Schellenberg uh, is very Schellenberg good. has done a great job. Right. But, but you know what? But here's the thing. Um, the nuclear community doesn't, and Schellenberger don't always really get along. He's one of the most pro-nuclear people out there, but the nuclear community doesn't really embrace him. They don't like some of his messages. Um, it's a problem. Because they're allergic. When I came over here, what struck me was um, how... The mindset was, let's not be visible. It'll blow over. Yeah. Uh, and uh, let's not raise this issue. Crazy. There's no you know, percentage in this. Whereas we, I tried to open up the public. Uh, our public hearing are as wide open as any, not, not is it wide open. We pay yeah, yeah, for yeah, people to come this. in. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and no matter who they are, and yeah. they, want it, they get the, the time. And so far, we were able to accommodate anybody who wants to come, yeah. even some of our, of your friends from down south, yeah. who are anti nuke beyond nuclear, and all those guys yeah, yeah, yeah. came over here to give us uh, their uh, advice. Yeah. So we have a very wide open kind of a thing, um, but it still doesn't resonate with the general public, even though on on you know on uh, appalling. Yeah. Uh, it's got a little bit better over the years, actually. Can uh, I can I tell you why I think it is? I've been interviewing not just nuclear people, but psychologists and sociologists as well. What makes people afraid of something is talking about safety. The more you talk about safety, the more people are scared. Well, that's the British uh, guy who's going all around and says, "Stop Mal- talking." Malcolm uh, Grimston, right? And he's right, right? And he's right. And, and you know, it's even worse than that. And this is, as uh, Malcolm Grimson hasn't even gone this far, but something else that I've discovered, it's not just talking about safety. It's implementing rules that put nuclear in a bracket so far outside in terms of environmental regulations, in terms of safety regulations. It's actually, it's not just that we're talking about it. We're doing it too. When we force there to be a four foot thick concrete dome over every one of these plants, when Fukushima proved that the offsite exposure couldn't even hurt anybody, it tells the public there's something to be so scared of in there that we are making it put four foot thick concrete domes over it. We're scaring the living daylights out of people. And then we come and then and then they come back uh, and we say, oh well they don't like nuclear, it must be because we're not safe enough. So they do it even more. It's like this compounding effect. Yeah, but you know that all the so-called um, experts in the world, they see the um, the UN CP, what do you call them? Uh, I, uh, soon I forget. Um, the uh, regulatory ex- bunch of experts that said the, the linear model works, which means there is no threshold, which means there is no safe radiation. Okay, so what do you think about the linear So threshold? ICPR, right? Is that what it's, they're called? Uh, uh, ICPRP. Uh, actually, I think oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So when they say that yeah. and they post so why did their they innovation, say that? Well, because at one true. time, it, no, because they couldn't prove, we have a couple of our very outliers, yeah. people who said, not only is it not true, there is a beneficial effect, yes. uh, the omissis kind of a thing. Yes. You think I can sell that to a bunch of scientists in, in, in this I don't, in the world? I don't think you can sell a bunch of scientists, but if the hormesis people are correct, that is the way you sell it to the public. 
you show the public confidence and you say, not only is a little bit of radiation not bad for you, it's good for you. But the nuclear industry, if I were the nuclear industry yeah. and I, there was a, a, a small percentage yeah. that it's true, yeah. I would pour millions of dollars no, to prove it. I, I don't think so. Because what the nuclear industry has been selling for the last uh, 30 years is safety equipment, safety services, radiation protection services. No, but the point here is that there is a level in uh, which you shouldn't worry about it. I know. Trust me. I, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. But the industry as it exists today does not sell nuclear power plants. No, but they, they sell radiation protection. No, but they, they, that's what caused the Japanese to go crazy and keep the treaty of um, uh, water in there instead of letting that's, it go to the ocean. That's right. And it's been a $200 billion boon to the nuclear cleanup industry. The nuclear industry makes its money off of selling fear, off of selling safety, off of selling radiation services. That is the nuclear industry. The nuclear industry that used to sell power plants died in 1980. No, I know, but, but uh, so if that is true, then uh, they, so then they don't you want have to advocate accept, for the, the No, but, but it, it'll be diminished because if the, if the industry dies, you have a, well, maybe the, you have a, maybe a, not in your lifetime, but it means that there is no future. I, I get it. It's totally counterproductive for the future. But the way that the organizations are set up today, <clears throat> the Westinghouses, the GEs, all of these companies that sell nuclear stuff, they are single purpose organizations to sell safety. They're not single organization purposes to sell nuclear power plants. Well, look, we are a safety organization. Right. It's built into our legislation. It's in our title, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. <laughs> yeah. Right. Which means... The, so, you know, post Fukushima, yeah. okay, what did we learn from Fukushima? That, um, that the shit happens, yeah. excuse my language here, yeah. and uh, you cannot anticipate everything. Yes. So, my, I, I started asking when I go into a hearing, they're giving me all those uh, low risk, low probability, and I said, I don't care about all of this. Doomsday scenario, it's now known in, in Canada as the been the doomsday scenario. I always ask, I don't care. Yeah. So there will be a tsunami in Lake Ontario. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah, yeah exactly, uh, right? exactly, yeah. Sh tell me that you can shut down the machine. Yeah. And all it meant was that you had to bring a little bit more pumps and hook them up to the core so you can actually shut it down. And if there's no road, you helicopter, etc. that's all it takes. I don't care about anything else. Yes. So... Rather than worry about the, uh, you know, but fine tuning down to the last microsievert. Yes. I rather do. You know what? Doesn't matter what happened. We are safe. Yes. That's the message that we've been trying to convey to everybody. And also the other thing that we've learned is what to do about emergency planning. Not that we were worried about because we know we're going to shut it down. Yeah. But it wasn't worthwhile fighting the fact that there's no KI pills uh, around the facilities. So I forced the health authority of Ontario. Yeah. You know what? You buy enough uh, KIP and send it to all the communities over there. So everybody gets it, uh, you know, for five years, a little box and years in case something happened, here's you for your kids. Yeah. That took away a lot of the aunties concerned with this. You put the two together, as far as I'm concerned, we have a pretty good safe and without putting extra requirement on the operators. Why it's so hard then for some a new reactor vendor to come to come to you guys and say, hey, listen, here's our pumps. We got some extra pumps. We got the iodine pills out there. Uh, why is this going to take more on than the, a couple months? On the new one, it's not going to be a problem, particularly if they're going to. So Darlington is a really interesting case. They have a license to build right now, okay. valid license to build. OK. Uh, it was to build, uh, in fact, in fact, it wasn't um, design specific. That's what really makes us different than Americans. Okay. It was parameter, license, yeah. parameter, um, uh, bounding parameters. As long as your emission is X or impact on water is Y, et cetera, et cetera, as long as you can build whatever you want, mm. as long as it's uh, subject yeah. to safety. Yeah. So they, got a, they already got a license in an approved thing they can build tomorrow morning. So what is stopping the reactor vendors from showing up and well, saying, you got the license, we got the technology, let's make ah, it happen? No, but they got to agree that they have the technology. So they don't know which technology to choose. And that's 
full circle. Yeah. That's what I'm worried about. They, they are worried about which technology to pick. So why don't you show up at their door and beat some sense into them? You got the credentials. You got, you got the expertise. <laughs> Make it happen. Get out there. I, you do you know, know the I, guy? Do you know the head of Darlington? Yeah. Okay, do, give him a call. Say, no, come on. I'll help you pick They it. know. They know. They sit on board. <laughs> they sit on board of directors of the new technologies. Okay, so why? What's they the sit up? on uh, terrestrial, for example, uh, both uh, OPG and. So what's the holdup? They want proof of concept. You know, I, I gotta tell you, I don't know how the um, the, uh, the the new scale got the uh, the valley the valley people to the utilities to actually. Agree to the build one. People. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they've done. There must have been some pretty arm twisting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They need to do something here, and I, I yeah. just don't think that the timing, because they're up to their eyeball in refurbishment, yeah. which is a huge project, which will go them for another 60, 70 years. So they have no incentive really to build a brand new kind of a yeah. problematic. So what's the next bet? I think path, the best then? bet yeah. is um, is CNL. Yeah, build a prototype there. You're saying. Yeah. Uh, Will they buy the electricity? Are they going to guarantee that they'll buy the electricity? Well, that's again the debate with CNL. CNL wants to build a real prototype uh, of um, of an actual, you know, electricity generating machine. Yeah. Whereas I thought um, they could quickly show a prototype to show the technology works. Mm. Um, they have to make the, Mark will have to make a decision by himself. Uh, there's a big debate in the industry about what kind of, uh, you know, but if they uh, agree with us and they left five or six of them, yeah, five or six it, would, it would be great. Yeah, whoever finishes it first to get uh, the contract, the PPA contract. Or, or, can, or can show that they have a good technology. Yeah. The other way is to send, to pick up a community or a mining community in the north and gamble on a company trying to play with this and maybe doing uh, the build, own, and operate. And what about just uh, finding a coal plant somewhere that's about to shut down and putting it right next to there on that site? Is that The site will be the same. They still have to go through, uh, but, uh, through an environmental assessment of yes. some sort. Uh, remember, the environmental assessment is uh, also a lot of the indigenous community are fearful of that. You know, They're fearful of nuclear. Oh, big time. Why? Because they believe that the uranium yeah. is the death rock. Really? Oh, get yeah. Out of here. Get into I thought there were these like hot springs in ancient culture where you go into the naturally heated uranium water and you get the radiation, it feels good. It's like, I thought that was a good thing. For Absolutely. But that's therapeutical. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny because when I came into this place today, you never asked me how I went from telecom to this. I asked, you just did uh, whatever story you want to go on. No, they, uh, <laughs> that was the, the, right, previous, tell me, tell me the, story. the previous president went into trouble and isotope production. Ah. Okay, she stopped producing the Molly 99. There was a big fight with ACL about whether ACL doing it safely or not. Mm. Um, and because of my regulatory background, they said to me, go in there and try to <laughs> help just stabilize the thing. So yeah. I was going to go for six months and then go back uh, to telecom. But the industry approached me to Stay. stick around. And I found it fascinating because, again, it was science. Yes. It was technology. Yes. And I always was in technology and science. And it was so primitive, the, 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 the science. You think that nuclear would have the, the most sophisticated science possible. They're getting paid, you know, our license fees were paid millions of dollars by sending checks in the mail. Uh, some of our inspectors... Well, I heard you guys don't have a wireless here yet in uh, no, the headquarters. Is that a point of contention? No, Should have, I cut that I out think, later? Uh, I think they have them now. Uh, <laughs> it took a while. Our inspectors, you know, the computer, our inspectors will go into the site. I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't say that publicly. Eh? Hey, you're retired. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> they actually, you know, I had to have uh, copies yeah. of the reports. Yeah. One to headquarters, one for them, one for the licensee that they inspected. They were using 
carbon copy. Carbon copy. You know what carbon copy is? Yeah, I've heard the I've heard the legends <laughs> <laughs> way before I was born. <laughs> so you know, so it was amazing to me that uh, they were not. We Why were allergic that, to give innovation. Me a, give me a reason. Give me a reason. Because Why, but it's a, n- nuclear is a magical technology. When when people first discovered you could create, uh, you could commercialize nuclear energy. That was l- that was like the future. I mean, that was uh, you were gonna have uh, buildings flying around, space station. I mean, literally, this was the key to the future. How did this magical technology, where all the smartest and the brightest engineers on planet Earth felt like naturally inclined to go? How did it end up with carbon copy? Well, because uh, because of complacency. When things work, what's the saying that goes with it? Don't screw it around. Yeah, yeah. Don't, bro- don't broke what ain't fixed. Right. Don't, don't fix what ain't broke. Exactly. Whereas revolutionary kind of uh, technologies, in fact, are disruptive. Yes. They break the old style. So, this, this community is allergic to innovation because... <laughs> oh, that remember, hurts my heart. No, but remember, if you tinker around with a valve here somewhere in this complicated machinery, yeah. you got to all of a sudden simulate and do all the probability safety analysis yeah. to try to figure out, well, what's the cause, blah, blah, blah. It's complicated, yes. Yeah. But it's no excuse not to try to put wireless monitoring using drones to see what's going on, using the digital um, uh, technologies. I, I, so I, I'm doing a tour of Pickering, which is an old, old machine. And uh, I, I hear a young kid with an old uh, engineer arguing. And I said, what is this? This is obsolete. I'm looking at the control room. The young kid said to me, yeah, we can hardly get any parts. And the old guy said, but you know, but it's, it's, um, it's safer because it's... Um, Hack proof or something? No, no, no. It's, uh, it's not digital. It's analog. Analog, yeah. So in analog, if you think about analog, it's not on off. It's not zero one. It's slow. So if, some, if shit happens, there's a little tail that tells you what to do. So the old timers love analog. <laughs> <laughs> Fact that you cannot get any <laughs> any uh, equipment, any replacement. Yeah. Um, so they're all migrating now to digital. And that caused huge problem internationally in the world when there's machine in the 30 years old, 40 years old. We have uh, old technologies and really hard to replace. So complacency and don't fix it because it's working, is the, the, the enemy of innovation. Do you think it's going to change? I mean, uh, natural gas is only getting cheaper. Uh, I mean, do, you th- do you think that the nuclear industry can change its culture and, and become an innovative culture? So uh, when I came over, I, you know, in the, my first six months when I came here, I said, oh, geez, everybody was talking about renaissance. And I said, my God, here is another revolution. I just went through my telecom revolution. Yeah, 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 you're excited. Yeah, That's excited. why you stayed. That's you know, why you stayed absolutely. on. Absolutely. <laughs> Renaissance is here. <laughs> That's before Fukushima they came in. Uh, and, you know, everybody was talking. Remember, before Fukushima? Yeah. It was huge uh, plans to build all kinds of nuclear. Another 30 new plans. But, th- but uh, okay, you say before Fukushima. I'm going to say before the, um, the economic crisis. That's how I'm going to demarcate the time. Okay. Because sometimes people... Think Fukushima was why we don't build, we didn't build new plants in the U.S. But it was the economic crisis why we stopped building. New well, plants. yeah, but there's a combination of both because then after Fukushima, people got off nuclear. Germany, Japan, all the rest of the thing. They, but but the but the key to all of this was that here we are, brand new. We're all going to move forward. I think my my view right now is, if SMR doesn't take off. This industry is dead. Yeah. But because, because they will look after after they finish EPR, the French, the American EPR, uh, 
the American construction, yeah. the costs were outrageous. Outrageous. Who's going to finance this? Nobody. So, so the point here is but, you've got to have a completely different structure I'm and financing. I'm terrified. So, listen, economics uh, can end industries, and it's it's what it's going to it's end, it's ending the old gigawatt scale industry. I'm afraid it might end the SMR industry too if they can't compete economically. They've got right. to be economically viable. But there's certain things that. So I just had a, a conversation with uh, Ramsey a minute ago, and one of the things that he said, which like I, I get it, I get why he feels so passionately about it, but I cringed when he said it, is that he said uh, a nuclear regulator has the authority to walk in and on any single person, any regulator can walk in and shut a whole plant down. Right. That kills the economics. If I'm an investor, I don't want to go anywhere near a plant where a regulator can just come in and shut me down. Well, th- unless you're prevented of losing your asset. But... If, uh, industry, if that, the industry is really good at preventing losing the as- assets from an economic perspective. We're counting on it. So in our safety model, yes. first line of attack is the operator. Yes. We're the second. Yes. So we are there to make sure that the operator is allowed to do whatever he needs to do yes. to save the machine Yes. until it's not salvageable. And then we say, shut it down and kill it. I don't care if you lose it. Yes, but my... Uh, <laughs> My fear is that, listen, regulators are, are trying to do their job well. They are tasked with safety. They're not tasked with making economic calculations. And so erring on the side of safety, they can, they'll can they be able to shut. They'll be shutting down plants before it gets to well, the Well, let's point. put it this way. We never shut down a plant. We, uh, we always gave them warning, said there's something you need to be improved. We temporarily agreed that they need to do something to shut down temporarily, to change something, etc. But it's all with a, almost a, a But in the U.S., agreement. maybe not in Canada, but in the U.S. we have. In the U.S., we've shut down plants to the point of them not being economical anymore. We've layered on additional requirements to the point where they're just like, you know what, we're throwing out this asset, which could be worth $10 billion, according to what we see at Vogel. Just shutting down assets because... Yeah, so co- post Fukushima, we had the task force. Yeah. And we sat down with line, you know, uh, operator by operator and agreed about this and the, the economic, about what makes economic sense yes. uh, for some safety enhancement to deal with the doomsday scenario. So they, we did. But, okay, but the doomsday scenario, doomsday scenario, if Fukushima proved that the worst thing that can happen to a light water reactor is nobody dies, why is nuclear still in the class of this is a dangerous thing? Because, so, for example, um, Pickering is right smack in downtown Toronto. Yeah. Um, so no matter what you say, the doomsday scenario over there is not like Fukushima. It's, it, it, they, they, if something shit happens over there, it could have major impact on people living right at the door. I don't know. I looked at I looked at the uh, the ra- the offsite radiation of Fukushima, what was made publicly available, mm-hmm. and I did not see a dose that could hurt anyone outside the fence boundary. Well, that's a huge debate about whether the the first couple of hours that came in. Remember, I was sitting there with your your friend Yasko. Uh, don't call him my friend. Hold on. Yeah, don't I mean, call him my what a what a. Okay, I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not going to say anything I'm going to say. And we were debating whether it should be 25 quick um, uh, evacuation zone or 50 and with the the French, et cetera, et cetera. It was a big debate about, you know, what could be the consequences and how far do you go? And all the embassies in Tokyo were worried about what are we going to do with the kids because the plume is coming to Tokyo. It was huge. But why, why was there a debate? Because after Chernobyl, so no way a light water reactor could ever release as much source term as the Chernobyl reactor, because that was a graphite thing on fire. The fire dispersed it. It just cannot happen with a light water reactor. Most of the stuff just melts down. It sits there. And then only our stupid hydrogen cloud, which we built with the pressurized containment dome, disperses some stuff around. Why is there even a debate amongst the nuclear community how much potential uh, radiological hazard there would be? We know, and even in Chernobyl, if all we did was not let the kids drink the cow milk, right, or we gave them the iodine pills, zero people would have got it hurt outside no, but, of Chernobyl. But, you know, those people who were actually trying to, uh, in Chernobyl, were right at the plant. On the site, on the plant. Right. Right, so but we should draw a distinction between on the plant and off the plant. Yeah, but remember that, uh, that Fukushima, the, the, the wonderful design, the 
I think GE design, where the fuel is on top in pond. I don't know who came up with this in no incredible stupid design. You put it in there and you didn't know what happened to the water, etc. So it could have turned into a big. Remember, we're talking about the first few hours of this event, and we have to make a decision whether to. I get, to I get it, but there, I just, you know, I, I go around. All I do is talk to nuclear experts. Not one of them can explain to me a biological mechanism which anyone off-site could get hurt by uh, radiation if all they do is don't drink the iodine. Well, the the thing is, not one, not one person is ever f found a way that someone could get hurt off-site from any nuclear so long as you don't drink the iodine. Well, I, I thought that the plume that comes in with a real heavy thing can cause you some significant injury. Now, you know, a plume moves, so it's a question of dose and time. Yeah. So I don't know. All I can tell you is that the, we all talk about evacuation zone. Uh, I think evacuation uh, should be off the table. Uh, Evacuations kill people. We know 100% that evacuations kill people. Thousand elderly died in uh, J Japan from evacuation. You're not, in Pickering, you're not going to get away without some evacuation plan. We evacuated because a truck uh, of a, a, a train came off and released some fume. Yeah. And the whole community had to, uh, elect <laughs> it. for the same reason, it'd probably yeah. be dispersed and there'd be no real serious yeah. uh, injury. Nevertheless, you do this. It's sometimes, if, even if they, you're right and there's no injury, it's the abundance of precaution, as they call. And you, you do this, if nothing else, to make sure that people are convinced that you did everything you could. Yeah. Sometimes that, that kind of a, a philosophy reigns here. It's the same thing that you have uh, um, uh, evacuation zones uh, and secondary, first, you know, first, etc. Uh, because of the plume migration. There's a, whole, there's a whole simulation about what happened to the fume, how long it stays, what the impact on food, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that goes in there. Till this day, they were talking about some, uh, what, in the UK, some sheep that still has a higher dose, and it still plays in the press, oh, don't eat that and don't eat there. When Fukushima happened, on CNN and on our own television, there were so-called experts telling Canadians, don't drink milk and don't eat apples that in Japan, still in Japan, when first traces of isotopes from Japan was detected in BC, people self-medicated. They went to the pharmacy, they bought KI pills. We had to send a doctor over there to say to them, don't do it. The, you know, there's absolutely no Too much reason. iodine. <laughs> you don't need that much. We put it in <laughs> the salt. There's some side effects also. <laughs> yeah. So just don't do that. Yeah. Uh, but that's the way life is. People see what they see, and some people take their own, their own um, uh, kind of measures, whether they're right or wrong. Uh, you know, in some of our public hearings, you, you heard some amazing uh, misinformation and I remember I used to ask uh, some of them, where do you get this stuff? And they said, well, it's on the internet. <laughs> yeah. I you know, know in, in, in Canada, they did a recent poll, it's about a couple of years now. The one thing, the one number that stuck in my mind, there was about 46%, 46% that, saw the th that actually said, science is a matter of opinion. <laughs> So, you know, how do you deal with that? I don't know. I don't okay. know. So we, we, it's the same thing that you deal with the vaccination again. You got to continue to hammer the truth uh, and hope that over time it'll, it'll sink in. We could talk for hours and someday <laughs> I hope to continue this conversation. But for now, thank you so much for everything that you've done for the community to encourage innovation in this space. Thanks for taking the time for me. And until next time, Michael Bender. Pleasure.